basically talking about higher eukaryotes. Um, I don't like higher eukaryotes at all. I just like to call them larger eukaryotes rather than higher eukaryotes, um, particularly based on some of my yeast friends, what they talk about. Um, so, oh, the other quick thing is I will, um, I am recording this, and so I'll put it up on YouTube so you can take a look at that as I usually do for these things. Um, so we'll talk about a um, couple of different things today, uh, mostly having to do with how people have figured out to, how to do basically selection for transformation. And so the whole idea here is putting specific genes into these larger eukaryotes, and in this case, basically you mean mice, um, and then showing you've actually done that because all transformation is sort of by definition very low frequency. And so how do you know you've done that? And the main thing is having a good selective way of doing that. Um, you can make your own genes, um, and particularly the important process here is taking a particular gene and making a very specific mutation in that gene. And that's really what we're going to be talking about here, and that's why people have gone through all of these processes. Um, one of the things that people got really good at pretty early on is doing gene knockouts and just getting rid of a gene, which is great and wonderful. And this is kind of what we do in our lab when we're knocking out a bunch of genes and people in their common DNA techniques lab are doing this too, knocking out genes. Uh, but the problem there is it's kind of like taking a sledgehammer to a lot of systems. If you knock out a gene completely um, in a embryo, for instance, often that gene's essential or essential for some part of the whole process. So it'd be really useful to have a way of getting rid of genes or actually regulating genes in some way that you can control. And so that's really all about the Cree-Lock system, this recombination process and how you can go about doing that. And then just later in the last decade or so is the controlled gene expression. And my favorite example of this is the um, what they call optogenetics, which is using light to regulate gene expression. This is just so amazingly cool, as you can take a cell, or even in some cases actually a whole organism, um, irradiate them with one particular wavelength of light, and then cause a genetic change to happen. Um, absolutely mind-blowing. Um, really, really cool process. So a um, couple of readings here, which I'm sure all of you read all of, right? Yes, oh, yeah. beforehand. We'll be giving you all quizzes on these as well. Um, I did actually go ahead and read all of these, and Dr. Bartlett sent them to me. Uh, so this, uh, the 2005 review by uh, Mario Capecci is actually really nice in terms of talking about you know, why a lot of these things were done and why a lot of these technique were, techniques were developed, and we'll talk quite a bit about that. Um, then this uh, pre-lock system, Brainbow, um, again, you know, talk about mind-blowing as you know, coloring different neurons, different colors, um, and that's all based on using the Cree lock system together with um, these reporter genes, and particularly important for these reporter genes are the various different fluorescent proteins. We could spend the whole lecture talking about fluorescent proteins. Fluorescent proteins are just amazing um, in terms of being, and most of these are autofluorescent, and so just the amino acids that are made in that protein will undergo own chemical reactions to generate a fluorophore, and from that fluorophore, then be able to be fluorescent. And there's a whole slew of these. We'll take a look at some of those, those pictures um, there as well. Um, optogenetics, this is sort of the first process where people talked about regulating gene expression with light, um, and then a nice review of that. And then if we get to it um, here at the very end, this is sort of a combination of all these different techniques in order to get regulation of some particular gene products. And so that's the, the very last of, of these lectures, um, part of the lecture here. So let's start talking about selection. And this is the absolutely critical part about getting that one cell that you're looking for. How do you isolate that particular cell that's got the particular gene that you want in it? And so there are Lots of different ways of doing that. Um, the main one that is used and also discussed very nicely in that Capecci paper are these uh, neogenes and they use these horrible names, G418. Um, that's just the name that the company came up with for this particular drug. Uh, but very similar to some of the pretty standard bacterial antibiotics, um, neomycin and canamycin. 
um, this particular gene, once it's inside the cell, provides resistance to these antibiotics. And so if you've got the gene, you're resistant. So if you treat all of your cells with that particular drug, the only cells that you're going to survive are the ones which have picked up that resistance gene. Um, similar kinds of things are these pyromycin resistance genes, bleomycin resistance gene. But these are an extra gene that you put into the cell and you know that you've gotten that gene inside the cell because all the other cells die when you put this in. And so this is your dominant selectable marker. Um, put it in, the only cells that can survive are the ones that pick this up. It's very similar when you think about bacteria putting in an antibiotic resistance gene. Um, very, very similar process, um, which is there. Yeah, Peter. Why? Why go to the trouble of using some different antibiotic uh, from the conventional selection ones? Ah, so I'm not sure I completely understand no, just, your question, but yeah. maybe, well, why not use ampicillin, for instance? Or I'm not sure quite yeah, so. I just, yeah, I mean, why, why not just use canamycin? Ah, right, so why not use, why not, why not? Why not just use canamycin or ampicillin? Right. Well, and also most of these work really well on bacteria, and don't work at all well on eukaryotic cells. <laughs> so that's the main reason: is that a lot of these um, drugs are going to be very specific for eukaryotic cells rather than for um, bacteria, um, and particularly things like canamycin, ampicillin, etc. So ampicillin is important for cell the cell wall. Um, canamycin, pyramycin are all important for translation. Translation in bacteria and eukaryotes is extremely different. Interestingly enough, you can actually use some of these things for uh, archaeal um, regulatory systems. So a lot of the eukaryotic um, antibiotics are good for using for archaea. Did, does Dr. Bartlett talk about archaea in here? I hope he does. Oh, good. Yes. Archaea. Archaea. Right. Um, so, so this is, this is you know, putting in this external gene. And these are all extra genes that those cells normally are not going to have. There's another kind of selection that you can do, and that's taking advantage of genes that are already in the cell. And those only work if you happen to have a eukaryotic cell that's either deficient in this gene that you put a new one into, or it's got some kind of slightly different activity relative to the gene that you're putting in. And the classic example here is thymidine kinase. And um, everyone remember thymidine kinase from 30 minutes ago? Those people in my virology lecture, what's thymidine kinase do? Adds a phosphate to thymidine. Adds a phosphate to thymidine, exactly. Why do you need to add a phosphate to thymidine? To make the triphosphate. Yeah, well, to make it yeah, diphosphate, triphosphate, but it's really important for DNA replication purposes. And so that's the main thing that thymidine kinase is used for. And there are lots of viral thymidine kinases. In fact, a lot of people use the herpes simplex virus thymidine kinase that we literally talked about about, what, how many minutes ago, Peter? 20, maybe? <laughs> it's a blur. <laughs> Something like that. Um, so um, thymidine kinase um, in cells is really important for making the precursors for DNA synthesis. But also, if you have um, what's called the salvage pathway, so pulling in any kind of extra nucleotides that have been broken down, you've got an RNA that you're not needing anymore, anything like that. Um, there also are processes which they call the de novo pathway. Um, most cells can actually take up precursors from the environment and make them into thymidine. But these TKs is sort of a backup pathway for allowing the cell to not have to depend on some of these de novo pathways. And it depends on the cell. Some cells actually don't have this process at all. Um, and some cells don't have this process either. But what happens is in many cases, you can make knockouts of this pathway here. And the only way that you can get thymidine monophosphate is to have this thymidine kinase process. 
And so here, um, usually you have cells that are either being completely lacking in this normal synthesis process, or you can literally grow them in a medium which blocks these enzymes. And so that's what's shown down here. Sorry about the um, standing in front of the slide here. But um, the HAT medium, hypoxanthine, aminoterin, thymidine, if you grow cells in this HAT medium, you block this process because the aminoterin blocks this DHFR enzyme, which is important for going from UDP to UMP um, and ending up in, in TMP. And hypoxanthine will allow you to make AMP, and then your thymidine kinase can give you TMP, which will lead to all of the other processes which you have to have. So HAT medium is sort of like making a mutant without having to make the mutant. It's just the drug that you put in there that blocks the one pathway. And if you put that in, then you are dependent on having this thymidine kinase from, in many cases, somewhere else. And so that's where the, the viral thymidine kinase is, that extra piece of DNA that you bring in there. So we can have drug resistance, which is one process, or we can have the endogenous process. We've knocked out one of the processes, and you need to bring in some extra activity um, in that process. Um, the other really cool thing about thymidine kinase um, is that you can also use this as a counter-selection. So counter-selections um, are great because, depending on one gene, you can either treat the cells in such a way that the cells with that gene will live, or you can treat the cells um, with other kinds of chemicals to make the cells that have that gene die. Um, and this is, you know, I don't know if you talked about um, uracil selections here, 5-chlororotic acid. No, no. <sighs> Mike. You did? You're just not admitting it? <laughs> okay, so I don't have to go and beat Mike up when he comes back. Okay, good. No, so um, the idea here is that basically um, if you feed a toxic precursor to a cell that has a particular enzyme that will take that precursor and make it toxic, then you have a way that you can get your counter selection. So you've got the gene in. In the presence of that gene, you'll take something which is otherwise non-toxic, I should say. So the, the non-toxic precursor, but if there's some enzymatic activity that makes it into a toxic molecule, you can use that as a counter-selection. And so thymidine kinase is one of those enzymes that you can use, and these pyrimidine biosynthetic enzymes are also some of those that you can use. And so the case in the pyrimidine biosynthetic enzymes are 5-fluorouracil. Um, 5-fluorouracil um, um, is highly toxic. But if you put in um, fluorotic acid, it's non-toxic unless you have the activity which will make it into fluorouracil. And so here, the case for thymidine kinase is if you put in bromodeoxyuridine or AZT, gangcyclovir, all wonderful antiviral drugs, um, these then will get phosphorylated because that's what thymidine kinase does. Um, and then once they're phosphorylated, then they get incorporated into the DNA. And if they get incorporated in the DNA, this becomes a toxic case. And in fact, that's exactly how AZT and particularly gangcyclovir work, is that they then get incorporated into the DNA of the virus, in this case, or in the case of AZT, um, in the <clears throat> DNA of the retrovirus, which is being used for this. Um, and then those then get um, broken down afterwards. So um, this is a really nice way to do, again, a counter selection, but the most powerful way to use these kinds of things is to use the same gene for two different kinds of selections. You use one particular gene for positive selection. Say in the case of thymidine kinase, the cells are only going to be able to grow in hat medium if they've picked up that gene. And then you can find the cells that have now lost this gene somehow, and we'll talk about how that is in just a second, then by treating them with something like 5-bromodeoxyuridine. And so you basically look for the gene going in and the gene coming back out. We'll look at those um, examples here in just a second. Um, diphtheria toxin is another way 
that you can do these kinds of, of counter selections. So uh, how do you get the DNA in? What did we do in the recombinant DNA lab? Zapped it! So electroporation is a really classic way of getting DNA into cells. Uh, Mario Capecci spends a long time. In his, how many actually people read that, the Capecci article? Yeah, I'm, I don't know your names. Well, actually, I do know lots of your names, but <laughs> I won't tell Dr. Bartlett. Uh, but no, he talks about doing microinjection. So some of the very early um, gene transfers were literally you would get cells in a really fine needle um, and inject the DNA through that needle um, with very low transformation frequencies, you know, one in a thousand. So you have to inject a, these cells, a thousand nuclei, in order to get one that actually works. And you've got to screen through all thousand of those nuclei. Think how many undergrads you'd need to do all these experiments. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so electroporation is really nice because you can get lots of cells at the same time. And then you need some way of selecting for those ones that get it. Now, there is another way which works way better. Chemical competency actually yeah, doesn't work very well with eukaryotic cells. What does a really good job of getting nucleic acid inside of eukaryotic cells? Viruses. Yes! <laughs> Always the answer. Always the answer is viruses. So um, this is the, the transient transformation process here, um, also very much known as transient transfection. Why fection? Because it's an infection. It's that process you have with the, the viruses. And so if we get there and I stop talking soon enough, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that last paper where they use transient transfection to bring in particular genes. And very often these are lentiviruses. And so instead of getting very low transformation frequencies, which is what you get normally, with, even with an electroporation, you have a pretty low transformation frequency. Um, but there you can at least do your selections. A lot of these viruses get pretty high um, transformation frequencies, and so you can actually do experiments without having to do selection. So this is the transient transformation process. But if you want to do some um, stable transformation, and particularly if you're thinking about doing a knockout mouse or doing some kind of recombination that's happening relative to your genome, then you want to have something which is stable. And in order to do that, you really do have to have some kind of selection. And usually, again, it's going to be these kinds of positive and, and negative selection processes, which we'll get to in, in just a second. Um, what are we trying to do? Um, lots of different ways here. Um, the classic is the knockout, the knockout mouse. You have a gene. You think you know what it does. You knock it out. You see what the phenotype is of that particular organism, which is missing that gene. So knockout mice. Um, I think, again, looking at Pecci's talk, that, that was his paper, I think, was in 2005. He said something, there were like eight to 10,000 um, knockout mice and you know, various different um, genes that people have been looking at. And people are actually now going through systematically and making knockouts of every single gene in the mouse genome and trying to see what happens in that case. Unfortunately, what happens in many cases is you never get a mouse, which um, death is a phenotype is a little hard to check on. So uh, having sort of the next steps, which are these conditional mutants, um, are a lot more powerful way of doing things. Another very powerful way of doing that is taking one gene and switching it out for another gene, um, what is so-called a knock-in experiment. And that way you can look at, you know, again, it may have been something which is absolutely critical. Maybe you've made a particular change in a gene. You want to see what that does now instead of getting rid of the whole gene. So it's a much finer way of your you know, surgery with actually a scalpel as opposed to surgery with a sledgehammer um, kind of process. Um, and then longer term, people are very interested in trying to use these kinds of things for gene therapy. You know, actually putting these kinds of constructs into people in order to correct genetic diseases. And then if you want to get really far afield, you can start thinking about putting genetic material into people to maybe not just correct things, but maybe make them better. So it brings up all kinds of interesting ethical questions about that as well. Uh, but certainly um, diseases. So let's look at how this happens. This is in fact from um, the Capecci paper, um, how this works. Um, so you take a piece of DNA, which you've made through all the wonderful recombinant techniques that you've talked about until now in the term. Uh, where we have one of these antibiotic resistance genes, in this case, um, neomycin resistance, 
on a linear piece of DNA, and it turns out that linear DNA works way better than circular DNA for these processes. Oops, uh, this is my cable here, which may or may not give up on me completely. Let's see, you guys didn't want to see this anyway, did you? So um, our selectable gene. And I'm just split gene for my as well. So uh, was it? Uh, okay, so it's not it's not just me. There we go. Okay, don't touch it, right? <laughs> I need the remote. Um, so we have our <clears throat> antibiotic resistance gene, um, and then sequences on either side of that, which are homologous, or in the best case, actually identical, to where you want this gene to go into the genome. So in theory, you can take this gene, um, say this construct, put it into the cell through electroporation or your microinjection, which is what they did originally, and then you'll have recombination that happens, and in this case it's in one of the exons of this particular gene, um, HPRT, and then you can see that this cell now is resistant to this particular drug, but at the same time, and this is what was really important with this particular process and why he started using the HPRT gene in the first place, is that you can also check for disruption of this gene. So there's another way that you can select for the disruption of, <clears throat> excuse me, HPRT1, and it's all about, you know, hypoxanthine, et cetera. Again, the, the actual process here is not that important, but it's a selectable gene. And so this is what they were doing to, in order to select this. The other thing which is important about this is on the X chromosome. And so X chromosomes are great. For what reason? Because you work with males, you only have one. So whenever you're talking about doing these kinds of experiments, anytime you're doing genetic manipulation of a diploid organism, it's a real pain because you've got to knock out both copies. So you've got to replace both copies. And so one way of dealing with that is to just use X chromosomes in males because then you just have that one particular gene you need to worry about. So uh, you can certainly do crosses, and that's in fact what people do now, is you then will get one copy which is changed, and then you do crosses, and then um, with those animals you'll end up with eventually a diploid. Um, but that's a long process. Yeah, Rachel. On the original piece that you put in, mm -hmm. yeah. it's going to now have that part. So, how do you keep that from breaking itself? Okay, so this is, again, this is, you know, I have to get used to looking at eukaryotic genes because there are always you know, introns and exons and all kinds of you know, crazy business here. Uh, but yeah, the, the main thing here is it's this exon. So, you're getting rid of this 8 exon, and you do need that 8 exon, exon 8, in order to get a functional HRPT gene. And so, you have exon 7 and exon 9 still. But you've lost exon eight. Right, but it because of homologous recombination, it can all know which piece of DNA that you injected, right? So how do you keep that little piece of DNA that now has the number eight on it from its being part? Oh right, yes. So um, it doesn't have an origin at that point, and that gets degraded actually quite quickly. Among other things, the thymidine salvage pathway <laughs> um, to then um, pick pick up pick pick those genes back up. And so um, this is great if you care about. HPRT, which we actually knew quite a lot about already. Um, but the basic process here was, does it work? And can we get it to work um, with this homologous recombination pathway? And people didn't even know that it was going to work. And again, there's a nice description about this in the, in the Capecci paper. Um, so <clears throat> that is great for doing gene disruption. But again, if you knock out that gene completely, um, then if it's important for some point of development that you don't even really care about, knocking it out can be um, a bit of a problem. So um, there are some other things that you can do. The other big problem, and I think um, Capeci also mentioned this quite nicely in his article, is that this homologous recombination is actually very infrequent relative to the times that this piece of DNA just gets incorporated randomly into the genome. So it's very important that you have ways of making sure that the mutation that you want is the mutation that you get, as opposed to some other random insertion. Because let's back up here real quickly. So neomycin resistance, 
if this is jumped into the genome somewhere else, your cells are going to be neomycin resistant. And so you're not going to have the mutation that you want. So you have to have some way of checking that. That's one of the nice things about HPRT, is HPRT you can select for and say, okay, I'm only going to get the ones which actually have this. And it was about one in a thousand that had this particular gene. So it's almost critical, and this is what people do now, is to have multiple markers. And the multiple marker process whereby you first try and get your mutation that you want through this homologous recombination and know that you're going to have incorporation in the wrong place in the genome. And so you have to have some way of counter-selecting, which is why we talked about the thymidine kinases and these precursors which become toxic in the presence of these gene. So you have other ways of checking to make sure that you have this particular insertion. Now one of the things here, if you have proper homologous recombination, you're going to get just this gene. If you happen to have an extra gene over here, say a thymidine kinase, uh, that if this linear piece integrates randomly into the genome, now you'll have neomycin resistance, but you'll also have this extra thymidine kinase gene here. If you now grow these cells with the drug, it's not actually neomycin, but close to neomycin, and a precursor, which then becomes a toxin if thymidine kinase is around, if it's integrated through homologous recombination, you're not going to have thymidine kinase because it's an extra piece of DNA that gets degraded because it doesn't have an origin of replication on it. Or it's going to be integrated in a whole piece fashion then you'll have thymine kinase and the drug resistance gene, so those cells are going to die. So the important thing is having the positive selection and the negative selection here. And, and that's what um, Mike put in here. Um, you can move these selectable marker genes around and particularly counter-select against some of these. And I like this um, image which he pulled up here. Um, here we have this transformation process. So in this case, you're trying to get recombination to get both your neoresistance and thymidine kinase through homologous recombination into this particular part of the genome. So you, your transformation, again, usually this be electroporation, select for this neomycin resistance, which, okay, it's fine. You'll end up with these kinds of cells. You'll also end up with things where this is incorporated into various different um, parts of the genome and you know, different pieces. But then what they do is here's a counter selection where you include one of these, again, you know, precursors that's fine by itself but lethal in the presence of thymine kinase. And what happens is this piece gets removed. Now, how do you remove this piece? There are lots of different ways of doing that. And we'll talk about pre locks recombination in just a second here. But if you have identical pieces on either side of those genes, then you can have a combination that happens between the two. And so that's nice and easy. But if you don't, how do you get these genes removed? Well, one way to do that, and this is a really cool technique, and it's a very clean strategy here, um, you now put in a second construct, which will have one very minor change that you want to be incorporating here. And that minor change now, because of homologous recombination, will again allow you to remove these things and, in that process, generate this small mutation. Now, if you have this incorporation, your neomycin and thymidine kinase, somewhere else in the genome, you're never going to be able to delete them with this particular construct. So you can either have, and again, I should have Surprised we didn't have this here. Um, here, you have your thymidine kinase out over here. And so it'll get incorporated if you have random insertion into the genome. Won't get incorporated if you have homologous recombination. Here, you're selecting for homologous recombination to get rid of these genes. And it's only going to get rid of these genes if you have this homologous template here. Yeah. Since the, the first vector and the, the second one mm -hmm. 
so more random in its entirety. Mm -hmm. Couldn't the second one do homologous recombination with it? And so you could end up with three and your mutated three in the same genome? Potentially. And I think that this depends on how much of the homology you have here on either side. Um, and it's going to be very important that you end up with. So, so basically your idea is this would incorporate, say, over here somewhere. And then you put this in and you select for your loss of the TK. And so then you get this incorporation of homologous recombination somewhere else in the genome. Um, basically, and I think Dr. Bartlett talks about this in some of the previous slides, um, you always have to go back and check to make sure that this is what has happened. Um, so yes, it will happen with a certain frequency. Check, check through sequencing. Yeah, checking through sequencing. And then the other thing, or PCR. Um, is usually a, a, a way that they do that. So to, do, to deal with that particular issue here is the best way to do that would be to have yet an, an extra marker um, over on this side over here, like I talked about before. And so um, like the diphtheria toxin, for instance, which is also something you can select against in a negative fashion. So if you have a diphtheria toxin hanging off the end of this particular one, you know that you've had this recombination, so you can at least selected for having this particular recombination take place. So yeah, the more markers that you have for these things, the better. It allows you to be a lot more flexible about things. And if you want to do multiple changes, so changing one gene is all well and good, but as we well know, many, many traits are multigenic. And so you want to be doing multiple different changes. And so to be able to do multiple different changes, it's very useful to be able to reuse these kinds of selectable markers. And so doing this kind of counter selection where you now get rid of these markers means that now you have this particular cell that has this one mutation in it. Now you can go back and do this whole thing again with some different gene. And so that's the idea there is you can continue to do this multiple, multiple times and end up with multiple different changes. So I think you haven't talked about CRISPRs yet, have you? Yeah. Yeah? OK. So another way to do these kind of things is CRISPR. So, pardon? Yeah. It was late on Friday afternoon. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. CRISPR is CRISPR's are so cool. But yeah. So if you're talking about using multiple markers, but yeah. the bottom it says that this overall is a very clean strategy because you don't have multiple Ah, no, the key is you've taken the markers back out and you can use them again. <laughs> so yes, it's a very clean strategy because it allows you to iterate. Because it's the, and that's a goal, it's called this markerless replacement. But it's not really markerless replacement. It's you put a marker in, which is what you needed, and then you use it to take it back out, and then at the end, what you've got doesn't have a marker in it anymore. Although, you usually want to have some marker to actually check, again, as we're talking about, <laughs> to make sure that you have what you think you have, um, which is really important. Yeah? Are, are there some complications that aren't being discussed here with frequency recombination and how close this gene of interest is to uh, chiasmata, where Connect and form those junctions. Okay, well, I think uh, the question again. It's, 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 it's hazy. Sorry. Yeah, so, well, these, I think uh, one of the things, again, is just getting back to your point, is you have to check to make sure that what you think you made really is what you've made. Um, and that does, again, you know, consume large amounts of graduate student or postdoc time <laughs> in order going back and checking all of these things um, to make sure what's going on there. So that's homologous recombination. Um, it's great and works reasonably well, and you get very specific changes which happen. But it's still relatively low frequency, and if you want to have a very specific change and more importantly control that change, you want to check out what viruses do, um, which is this um, site-specific recombination. So very specific machinery, which I actually first understood in bacteriophage lambda, but since other bacterial viruses, which take very specific sequences and can recombine them between those two sequences. And there are basically two different ways that you can get recombination, depending on how the sequences are oriented relative to each other. And so this is the system which is mostly used now in eukaryotic cells called the Cree lock system. So the Cree is the recombinase. The locks are the sites which that recombinase actually binds to. 
And so these are the sequences here, which I'm sure Dr. Bartligan is going to ask you on an exam exactly what these sequences are. <laughs> They're inverted repeat sequences. And what that means is on one strand, 5 prime to 3 prime, you have the same sequence on the opposite strand at the other end from 5 prime to 3 prime. So 5 prime, A, T, A, C, T, T, C, G, T, A, T, A, A, T, A, C, T, T, C, G, T, A, T. So, right? Everybody got the sequence? All memorized? Good. No problem. No, but it's these inverted repeat sequences, and these are just the, the lock sequences. Um, these then are going to be the binding site for the Cree recombinase, which is going to come down, bind to these sites, and recombine them with other sites which are there. And basically, in this particular case, if you've got these two inverted repeat sequences, what the Cree recombinase is going to do is bind to and chop out all of the DNA that's between these two sites. Turns out that if you have these inverted repeats, then you can have this kind of recombination. If you have direct repeats, that actually will excise. So maybe I, I misspoke here just a second ago. Go back and change the tape. Um, if you have directly repeated sequences, again, it's the same sequence on the same strand, you have recombination that takes place, is what, what lambda does, um, it will chop out whatever's in between. If you have inverted repeat sequences, so that's why I misspoke last time, all it does will invert the sequence, which is between those two, the presence of the Cree recombinant. So you have to take one end and hook it back together. And it'd be easier to look at, I should have brought um, the lambda recombination here. So this is a crossing over that takes place. Um, and if you have repeated sequences, that crossing over will delete or insert the sequence, which is between those direct repeats. And so what happens in Lambda is you have a repeated sequence here and a repeated sequence here in your virus genome, repeated sequence here in the cellular genome. The Lambda integrase will bind to these two sequences and put the Lambda genome into the host. Here, if you've got inverted repeated sequences, that process which is a, you know, the crossing over that takes place here, um, we'll just invert whatever the sequences are between these, these particular two here. And so Cree is the recombinase that does this, and it binds to the lock sites. Again, all you need to remember for this, direct repeats, deletion or insertion, inverted repeats, inversions that take place. And so all you need to do here, just a second, Rachel, is now introduce these sequences, presumably by homologous recombination on whatever else you have on the outside here, into your genome, and then put in the Cree protein, or turn it on at a particular time, and then you can have a particular change happening at a very particular time, or in a particular situation. Yeah, Rachel. Oh, so the question here basically, sorry to, to paraphrase this, is how long can this distance be? That's a good question. I don't know the exact number for that. Certainly in the case of Lambda, it's about 50 KB. So it can be pretty big pieces. Um, and I think for Cree locks, it's similar. But that, that I, don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, but certainly tens of KB. So you can certainly you can put quite a bit um, in between these things. And as we'll see when we look at the uh, fluorescent proteins, um, the, particularly for the Brainbow experiment, that's where they've got, they've got big pieces. I mean, the, the whole um, fluorescent protein gene, which is between these sequences. Uh, a lot of time what people talk about is if you have now this gene that has these lock sites on either side of it, the eukaryotic genesis will call this a phylloxed gene. Ridiculous, but it's a flanking LOX sites. So I, I phloxed the gene for you know, XYZ. Again, horrible molecular biology language. Um, but it means you've got um, a particular gene that's got <coughs> LOX sites on either side of it, which means if you in put the Cree gene into that particular cell that particular time, it will either invert it if you've got inverted repeats or delete it if you've got these direct repeats relative to each other. And so this is really cool because if you can now control when the Cree gene gets expressed, 
you can now have a deletion or a rearrangement of your genome under very defined conditions. So instead of the homologous recombination that you have to do and get that one particular knockout, or knock-in for that matter, and then follow through with that whole process, now you can very carefully control when you have this particular change um, that takes place. And so you can delete whenever you want to. Um, if you have an embryonic lethal deletion, now you can delete it much later in the whole process. And so it allows much more flexibility in terms of looking at these various different genes. So um, it's a little out of order here. We talked about this already. Uh, homologous recombination, how can it be a problem? It's because you have random insertion. So that's why you add your negative selection on the outside. Um, and then you can make sure that you have a specific integration that's happened through homologous recombination. We'll take a look at that as well. And then this is getting back to your question, you know, screening all of your transformers, usually by PCR, um, resequencing a whole genome, particularly if we think in the mouse genome is getting a little expensive. Um, so here's that process. Here we have our neomycin thymidine kinase genes and this diphtheria toxin gene on the outside of the end of the genome. So this is basically exactly what we were talking about with this um, recombination that we had before. So here you do your first selection, which will have neomycin resistance, but it will <clears throat> be resistant to the diphtheria toxin because this gene is missing because you had homologous recombination. If you didn't have a homologous recombination, that this um, diphtheria toxin gene is going to kill off all the cells. So now you know you've got this one. And now, in this case, they did CRE recombination because they had these LOX sites. They'd floxed their neomycin and thymidine kinase genes. You have CRE-mediated recombination. And now you can do your counter-selection based on thymidine kinase in order to make sure that you've now made this particular deletion. Why you just want to delete the neomycin and thymidine kinase? Like, huh? Okay, what's going on here? But what happens now is you end up with just this single point mutation that you put in here in the first construct. Does this make sense? So we've got first your selection for neomycin resistance, counter selection with diphtheria toxin. Then that'll give us this recombination. You add CRE and then you can select for the deletion of these two genes because you're counter-selecting against thymidine kinase. And then, again, the nice thing about this, you have a clean replacement, so now you can go back and do this again, make a different construct, put in neomycin thymidine kinase somewhere else in the genome, and end up um, making this whole process. So this is a specific point mutation which you made just through the homologous recombination back here in exon 3, or whatever locus this happens to be. Um, the other thing that you can do is now use um, lock sites for regulating transcription. We'll talk about that in just a second. Yes, but before we get there. Uh, is there a limit to how many times you can iterate this? Would you like if you do it a bunch of times, you just end up with a bunch of lock sites all over the genome? There, in theory, there would be a limit to this, but because there's so much junk DNA in the genome, there doesn't really seem to be. And so people have um, incorporated, I think, I'm trying to remember some of the papers I looked at, but you can get many, many lock sites in genomes and it doesn't seem to make a difference. So uh, the only issue would be, of course, and getting back to Rachel's question, is maybe you've got a, you've got a lock site here and then you make a mutation over here in this exon, then you have a lock site over here. Then you put in Cree, you might end up deleting the whole thing. So they, they, that's the issue, is that you have too many of these lock sites, then you might end up getting the, the recombination that you don't want to happen there. So that would be the downside of having all of these extra ones in there. Uh, but you can also use lock sites for activating genes and activating transcription of genes. This is just a deletion process here of these genes. How you do that is by <clears throat> taking out terminations sites of transcription. So here's your poly A tail. Well, how do you get poly A tails? Binding sites for CPSF, CSTF, 
that molecular biology course that we've all forgotten way back when. Yeah, so uh, the <clears throat> you have a promoter here, normal, boring, dull, RNA polymerase 2 promoter, which will then transcribe. That messenger RNA will have a binding site for the tailing proteins, which will then cause cleavage of your messenger RNA, poly-A tail, termination of transcription. If, however, you have phloxed this poly-A site and put in Cre, now you can get transcription all the way into your uh, particular gene that you're interested in getting being transcribed at one particular place and time. And this is partly how you can get the cool labeling that we're just about to talk about in a second. So any questions about this sort of, you know, Cree recombinase? You can also think about how you could do this to um, change translation, you know, all kinds of different possibilities that you can use for this, this Cree recombination. It's a really neat process. Usually what people do for getting the Cree recombinase in is doing some kind of transient transformation to get the Cree in in the first place. Although when we talk about optogenetics, we'll talk about some of the ways that they can be used as well. Yeah? Um, when you do the inverted swap sequences, mm -hmm. is that for like maybe giving a negative strand? Like, um, like if you have a gene on the negative strand, then you can do the inverted strand to get that area? Like, yeah, so, so, so I guess I'll, I'll paraphrase your question, but basically, can you use inversion in order to get antisense RNA? Um, and yes, exactly, you can do that. People have done that. <laughs> and so that's what they'll do, is in that you have this recombination. And so this is actually a really good thing to do if you're thinking about how you have a diploid organism. And so one of the copies is normal, the other copy is floxed, and you have that inversion that takes place. So expression of this will shut down expression of that. So your diploid copy, your one copy will have it, the other copy won't. And so the one copy is making an antisense to your normal copy, and that you can use that to downregulate that other copy. Yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> um, it's a neat process. Now, this is the, um, the other paper. And if you only look at one of the papers that you put online, I would look at this one. But it's, it's absolutely mind-blowing in terms of uh, the things they're able to do with this. So this is um, mapping neurons in brains. Now, one of the big issues with the whole brain um, process is there's so many neurons that are innervating so many different other neurons. And so if there was a way that you'd actually start to pull apart each of these individual neurons, which look really, really similar to each other, that would be an incredibly useful technique to have. Now, how to go about doing this? Um, basically, paint by numbers. <laughs> <laughs> give each of these neurons different colors with different um, kinds of fluorescent proteins. And so how do you do that? You basically need reporter genes and particularly these fluorescent reporter genes. And so how do we do that? Um, we've got to use these reporters. There are lots of different kinds of reporters. We're mostly going to talk about these fluorescent proteins. Um, the idea with a fluorescent protein marker is you shine light at one wavelength at that particular fluorophore, it will emit light at a different wavelength. And so that way you can see different colors um, which are there. Um, this is used very, very commonly in living cells because it's a way that you can actually image a cell while it is doing whatever it's doing. Um, on the other hand, many of these other um, beta-galactosidase, often you actually have to kill the cells in order to get that, although <laughs> A wonderful quote that's in, I think, one of the, the labeling chapter um, says that you know beta galactoside is such a pretty color. You go from X gal to um, the um, X color, which is brilliant blue indigo color, is the it's a really intelligent process. And it turns out E. coli is really good at doing this. So one of um, I think it was François Jacob said that means E. coli must be incredibly intelligent because it has this beta galactoside ASP. Um, but um, beta galactoside is, is a Enzyme, um, but it's very specific to bacteria. Um, very few eukaryotic cells will have this beta glycosidase. If you incorporate this particular gene, then you can see um, whatever is being expressed is just that one particular gene. Um, luciferase is similar, emits light, but again, we're mostly going to talk about these fluorescent proteins. Um, why having these reporter genes? Um, one is just a way to identify these cells, and that's what we'll talk about in terms of the um, rainbow experiment. 
Um, but is the gene being expressed? Where is this gene being expressed? Subcellular location, etc. cetera. Um, lots and lots of different proteins. Um, the green fluorescent protein, this is sort of the original uh, green fluorescent protein here, although this is now the enhanced green fluorescent protein, but all the way from blue um, to red proteins um, you can get as fluorescent proteins. And so you can do multiple different colors, multiple different uh, proteins that you're looking at in any given cell. Um, lots of people use this particular one, M. cherry. You'll see this a lot in the literature. Um, and then these enhanced green fluorescent proteins, um, yellow fluorescent proteins, at least to me, it looks more green than yellow. Uh, these are all things that were found originally. The green fluorescent proteins were found in jellyfish. Um, and then these other proteins were found in various other um, naturally fluorescent. But again, the neat thing about these fluorescent proteins is you don't have to add any extra kind of substrate to them. They actually are autofluorescent. You can express the protein on a certain stretch of amino acids that will then convert itself into a fluorophore. Really cool chemistry that, again, we don't have time to get into today. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So uh, let's look at how this has been used with this um, Cree LOX system um, in terms of the, the brain bow. And so the idea here, this is getting back to your question, Rachel, about how big the pieces can be um, in between these, these flock sites, is what they did is they figured out a way to make LOX sites that were mutually incompatible. And so what that means, if you have one set of LOX sites that recombines, the other one is not going to recombine. And so in this case, all that they did is they made a particular construct, put this into neurons, where they have the red fluorescent protein, yellow fluorescent protein, and cyan fluorescent protein. In the absence of recombination, you just get the red fluorescent protein. But if you turn on pre, there are two different kinds of recombinations you can get. You can either delete the RFP, or you can delete RFP and YFP. So you end up with three potential different colors here, absence of Cree, presence of Cree, two different possibilities. And so here is this recombination that's taken place here. In the absence of Cree, all these cells are stained with the red fluorescent protein. And plus Cree, you end up with this amazing sort of modern art piece <laughs> where uh, the in some cases, you won't have had the recombination that takes place. And in some cases, it will have deleted one of them. In other cases, it will have deleted the other one. And so here, what looks like otherwise a mass, you can actually start to pick out the individual cells here relative to each other. So this is a really neat way of now just, and they're all the same kind of cells. It's just some of them have had this one recombination, some had the other recombination, some had no recombination. And then they kind of went to the extreme with this and then started to look at neurons with these same three constructs, but now hooked up in such a way that you could have inversions and duplications of these different constructs. And what you ended up with is not just three. This is, they ended up, I think it was like seven of these different copies that were either all blue or partly blue or more green, completely green, different greens, oranges, reds, etc. And this is just different combinations of, in this case, three different fluorescent proteins. And in this process, we map all of these different neurons. And you can zoom in microscopically to each of these different projections coming off of these neurons and identify which one they've come from um, over here. So again, if you read only one of these papers, this is the one to read because it's really amazing. They call it the rainbow. I'm not sure how long it can take to up with that one particular process. But the um, rainbow expression with these um, different combinations of, of fluorescent proteins um, can give you a different, all these different kinds of colorations here. And all it is is Cree. How are you getting Cree in this case? It's not actually a 
transient transformation. Um, in this case, it's uh, a regulated gene, um, tamoxifen, which is the Paxol um, anti-breast cancer, but again, it turns on um, particular genes. In this case, you just turn on Cree and turns on randomly in the different cells and will randomly give these different combinations of these breast Do you have a question? Okay. <laughs> so um, again, if you read only one of these papers, this is, this is the one. This is the one to read. There's all these um, kinds of different processes here. So <clears throat> that's just looking at individual cells. Great, cool, wonderful. But usually, you care about the actual activity of a particular gene. If you're a recombinant, recombinant DNA guru, like of course all of us are, we're looking at that. So lots of different ways of looking at that. One is antisense. We talked about actually you just literally use Cree to give you an antisense um, RNA. But more often what you do is you do homologous recombination, and homologous recombination is put in a particular gene that is an antisense gene to something that you're interested in, as opposed to just flipping one um, already. Uh, the other thing you can do is RNA interference, double-stranded RNAs, which are really good at leading to either suppression of translation or, in perfect match cases, actually degradation of RNAs, degradation of messenger RNAs, um, gene silencing process. Um, and you can either make these um, as particular transgenes that you put in through homologous recombination, et cetera. Um, C. elegans is a really amazing organism that you can just take these double-stranded RNAs and inject the double-stranded RNA into the worm and that causes suppression of particular genes that then have that matching RNA sequence. And my favorite thing that I've heard of with what people do with worms is um, the C. elegans, the E. coli. So one of the standard foods for C. elegans. You can actually have an E. coli with a recombinant plasmid in it that makes double-stranded RNA and the worms will eat that and then suppress the gene based on what they're eating. So cool <laughs> uh, with that process. And um, you can also do this um, antibody inhibition. This is very rarely used, but um, antisense RNA and RNA interference are really a pretty classic process and paper at the end that we're probably not going to get to. <laughs> uh, basically has a way through Cree-Lox recombination to turn on expression of some of these small interfering RNAs. Um, another thing that people are very interested in doing, particularly if you're somebody like Dr. Bartlett or me, who's interested in transcriptional regulation, is having a way to regulate expression of certain genes at certain times in a cell. And that's often done through this so-called TET regulatory mechanism. TET is tetracycline. Antibiotic is really good at suppressing growth of bacteria. It does absolutely nothing to eukaryotic cells, which is why it's such a good thing to use for these processes. Uh, there's TET resistance genes, again, from bacteria. And what they do is they'll bind very specifically to tetracycline and lead to expression of tetracycline resistance genes. And so the smart eukaryotic molecular biologist said, hey, we can take advantage of this system. It's a very tight binding of tetracycline, and tetracycline is doing nothing in your eukaryotic cell otherwise. Tetracycline actually gets into cells really quite well. And now what we'll do is we'll take this TET-R protein, which is a TET repressor protein, hook it up to, what the heck is this? Anybody listening last lecture? The gangbuster transcriptional activator, VP16 from herpes virus, HSV. So absolutely wonderful transcriptional activation domain that doesn't work unless it's bound to DNA. How are you going to get it bind to DNA? Hook it up to the tetracycline receptor, repressor. Excuse me. So um, TET-A is a transactivator. Um, TET repressor is binding here to the DNA. So if you have <coughs> the... Tet repressor in the presence of tetracycline doesn't bind. In the absence of tetracycline, will bind very nicely and lead to expression of whatever gene you put right next to it. 
Um, and this process, it goes through this whole process again, this is in your uh, readings here, um, how you can have regulation of very small amounts of your trans activator um, for tetracycline. There are actually two different ways that you can do this. You can either repress genes or activate genes, but just by throwing in tetracycline. Um, and it's a very nice process and in fact sold by a number of biotech companies. So tetracycline is great, you can throw in the drug, it's great. But I think the coolest way to regulate genes is through light. And that's um, this last process, and this is the last thing we'll talk about today because I'm already out of time. How did that happen? Um, optogenetics. So controlling protein activity with light. And basically this is, you've got some protein, and these are often very often plant proteins because plants respond to light. Um, and in the presence of the appropriate wavelength of light, there'll be some kind of change that happens to that protein. It can either be some kind of conformational change, which actually is very similar to what happens in your eyes when you actually detect something, uh, the rhodopsin, <coughs> opsins, are things that change just you know, binding to light. So that change in structure can be something that can be detected. Or in the case of these cryptochromes, um, have a change in terms of the partners that they're interacting with. And that's what's shown here. We have a cryptochrome that interacts with the cryptochrome interaction protein here, the CID. These two guys are only going to interact with each other in blue light. In the absence of blue light, no interaction. In the presence of blue light, they will interact. And this is a classic process where you take a DNA binding domain from one transcription regulator, fuse it to a potential interaction protein, you take the activation domain from that particular transcriptional activator, fuse it to this other protein, these two guys interact with each other, and you end up with expression of this particular reporter gene next to this guy right here. People have used these kinds of interactions in many, many, many different ways. Um, this is sort of the classic one here. You have a one of your partners, here's a second of your partners, you get them to come together in the presence of light, that will then make some signal, say this would be a tyrosine receptor, for instance, you have these two now that interact with each other, this now leads to whatever progress that you want to have. Also used for transcriptional activators, many transcriptional activators only work as dimers, how do you get that dimerization to take place? You get it to take place because of this light-driven interaction between the two of them coming together. Um, other processes as well, but these are sort of the main ones here is usually bringing two proteins together that otherwise would not be being brought together. You can just shine the light on them and have this happen. Or you can turn on transcriptional regulation by, again, shining light on the cells and getting them to express um, particular genes at particular times. This is a really amazing technique because it's completely controllable um, down to millisecond kinds of timescales in terms of getting this activation. There's a nice review about this uh, as well. So 11.20, we're done, right? How did that happen? <laughs> uh, this is a paper, talks about pre-recombination for RNA interference, cool antiviral vectors, but I'll tell the Dr. Bartlett I didn't have a chance to talk about it. Um, I will um, put this recording online on my YouTube channel, and I'll get him to um, put, a, actually I'll put a link um, on the D2L page for this as well.